Good afternoon. I'm coming here today to talk about the history of the Caprini score. And this is dedicated to all of those professionals who have worked so hard on this score around the world and contributed uh, as of today, 194 articles in 5 million patients looking at the score. And they presented the good parts of it. They presented parts that they think need to be maybe updated. And also more importantly, established the set point between high and very high risk patients in their individual population. And that is the major punchline today, which I would like to have everybody understand that we are going to learn from wonderful people all around the world. And unfortunately, they're not yet part of the guidelines. That doesn't in any way lessen their importance. And I would like to begin by just showing you a picture of the largest study ever done so far using the Caprini score in 2,795,000 patients with a clear relationship between the incidence of venous thrombosis and the score. And as I said before, this isn't in the guidelines. So let's, let's go back and take a look at the guidelines. 2012, for the first time, the ACCP guidelines acknowledged the importance of risk assessment. And here we see their analysis of the Caprini score, low, very low, low, moderate, and high risk. And they classify everything as five or above as high risk. And this was based on five papers used to develop the guideline. And as I told you, there's now 194. In any way, they envisioned that 6% of the patients that had a score of over five would get a clot if they didn't have prophylaxis. But we're going to keep that number in mind. Now, nine years have passed. And at the end of 2019, the American Society of Hematology published some very high level, high quality update of the original thrombosis prophylaxis guidelines for surgical patients. And this time they also included orthopedics. And we were very much looking forward to that because I, we had been following all the data from all over the world in the intervening years and couldn't wait to see how the authorities would react to that. Some of those were observational articles, so I wouldn't expect that they would be in a, a in a high quality document like these guidelines. But certainly I would expect that things like the meta-analysis would be there. And certainly studies that were as good as the original studies that CHEST used in 2012. So here's what they said. Scoring systems that calculate the risk of post-operative VTE for individual patients, such as the Caprini score, have been developed and validated following some surgical procedures. A widely used high quality guideline is the 2012 guideline of the American College of Chest Physicians, which places a strong emphasis on VTE risk scores. In the guideline recommendations for VTE prevention in the non-orthopedic surgical patients, patient-oriented VTE risk calculators such as the Caprini score and the Rogers score were adopted. Now, nothing much happened to the, to the Roger score, but the Caprini score, as I said before, was, was widely used based on this very positive recommendation. The only guidance was given to the, to the people reading the guideline was the original disease of the month pop, pop, publication from 2005. So the original five studies used to calculate the highest risk set point for VTE in the 12, 2012 guidelines was five plus. Currently, we have 194 studies demonstrating the direct relationship between the score and VTE incidence. Now, it's very important to understand that the data, especially from the meta-analysis and other studies, such as head and neck surgery, show that not all of those with a score of five plus are at high risk. In some surgical studies, the score of five is associated with a low risk. And this incidence is not further reduced using anticoagulants that was nicely shown by Christopher Panucci in this very well done meta-analysis in 2017. But what's even more important was these studies also have identified a very high risk score for VTE that also varies according to the surgical population. 
Now, why is that important? You're going to give everybody prophylaxis. No, no, not necessarily. Those people with very high scores may need ongoing prophylaxis for an extended period of time after hospitalization. Remember, as, as we're going to see was done in the Boston studies. And also, there may be breakthrough thrombosis, also shown by the Boston group. And that may indicate that you might want to use double the amount of prophylaxis in that very high risk group. And in summary, it's very important to understand the three pillars, like Virchow's triad of the Caprini score. Number one, protecting those low risk patients from getting anticoagulants that will only increase their bleeding risk. Number two, to provide anticoagulant prophylaxis for those who truly are at risk of VTE. And number three, to provide those patients with very high risk, extended prophylaxis and or enhanced prophylaxis. Let's take a look at some of these studies. Here's the original study in general surgery, and here's the five cutoff with a 1.3% incidence of VTE. But look what happens when you get over eight, 6.5%. Now let's look at five studies that were done, five universities, uh, plastic surgery patients, and the score of five was associated with a little over 1% incidence of thrombosis. Look what happened when the score got eight or above, 11%. That's the high risk group we're talking about. Now the corollary of that, look at head and neck surgery in this study. And there are several studies like this. There's almost, there, there's no clots until the patients really get up two tenths of a percent. Finally, not even 1% at five to six. Then it jumps to 2.4 at seven to eight. And then it jumps to 18.3 when the score gets nine and above. Do you see how important it is to establish the set point for high and highest risk in your individual population. In order to give patients, again, those low risk, don't give them prophylaxis. Those at risk, give them standard prophylaxis. And those at very high risk, either extended prophylaxis and or enhanced prophylaxis. The figures in ICU are a little bit more in a linear fashion with increasing numbers of score related to increasing VTE events. If we go back and took a look at the original Ball article in 2010 from the University of Michigan, and about half the patients had a score of five or less. But if you look at those people that had a score of 10 and above, there weren't too many of them in the study, but they all got clots. Again, showing you that high, high risk group. I'd now like to present what I call the poster child for thrombosis prophylaxis in the, in, 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 from an American site. And of course, Michigan had done a tremendous amount before this, but this is what they did at Boston University. They had a very high incidence of venous thrombosis in their surgical patients. So they put together the system and they took the Caprini score and they divided it into low, moderate and high risk patients with a mandated length of prophylaxis and use of prophylaxis depending on the score. And of course the doctor could opt out of it if he so choose or she so choose but otherwise, most, most of the people were, uh, had to have this score done before the orders could be signed. And this included length of prophylaxis. Here we see the, the, the first part of this, and you can see the low, uh, lowest low and moderate risk patients. There was 100% compliance, and you could do what you wanted during the hospitalization. But you'll notice here they do have heparin or low molecular weight heparin in for these low risk patients. Why is that? That doesn't help, We've, we know that now. But we didn't know it quite then. And at the time they did this study, they were under the JACO mandated SKIP protocol, Surgical Care Improvement Project, where every patient having surgery had to have a dose of heparin or low molecular weight heparin within 24 hours of surgery, unless they were at high risk of bleeding. And later, a large study in the VA and other studies showed that this didn't work. It didn't. One shot of heparin or low molecular weight heparin did not change the VTE incidence. Now we talk about those people who had a score of five to eight. They were given seven to 10 days of low molecular weight heparin, regardless of whether or not they were in the hospital or whether they went home. And then if they had a score of nine and above, they got 30 days of low molecular weight heparin, again, regardless of their location. Now, wait a minute. 
you might say it's very difficult to give all these patients 30 days, seven days or 30 days of prophylaxis. It's very expensive, pain, painful. People don't want to do it. Well, how do, how, do you, how do you get this done? Well, for one, there was good education by the doctors. And number two, and a very important point, was the hospital administration made a, an arrangement with the drug company so that all patients who were candidates for this treatment got all of the medication they needed regardless of their ability to pay. And look at the astonishing results. The very high incidence of venous thromboembolism at 30 days in these patients was reduced to a nadir of, of a tenth of a percent with 30-day results. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could replicate the Boston program everywhere in the country, including taking care of the payments in case the patients couldn't pay? Food for thought. Nowhere to be seen in the guidelines, but incredibly important to know. Now, Oftentimes, people who are very strict advocates of the guidelines say that uh, opinions without data, meaning the guideline data, for example, are just opinions, and everybody has one. But there's another side to this story known as the real world experience. Here we're seeing real world experience, and I can tell you that the Boston University has continued this program, published more papers on this subject right up to today. Real world experience is important. Let's have a look at that meta-analysis just very briefly. In these studies, and these were the 13 best studies that were early done regarding the Caprini score in general in vascular surgery and included plastic surgery patients as well. Christopher Panucci, a bright young investigator who's gone on to be a brilliant plastic surgeon, showed that in those patients who had a Caprini score and didn't get prophylaxis. If the score was three to four, the incidence was seven tenths percent, five to six, it went up to 1.8, jumped to 4% when the score was seven to eight without prophylaxis. And if the patients did not receive prophylaxis and they had a score of over eight, 10% of them got a clot. Now, can and you imagine that? You better do scores in your patients. And if that patient has a high score, that patient could be its subject to uh, venous thromboembolism if they don't get prophylaxis. Highly statistically significant, and there are the details. But that's not all. Patients with scores of six or less, which was 75% of the population, did not have a significant VTE risk reduction with chemoprophylaxis. <clears throat> Excuse me, so it didn't help. So giving it to them only increased their bleeding complications. On the other hand, patients with scores of seven to eight and over eight had significant VTE risk reduction postoperatively when they received chemoprophylaxis. Now we don't have length of prophylaxis here, and this is one of the few places that we can find that in hospital prophylaxis, even though it wasn't long as, as long as we might like, it was important to prevent venous thromboembolism. Very important data, and this data needs to be understood by everyone because it's very, very important for a clinical practice. Now let's talk about the Vietnamese study. In four Hanoi hospitals over two years, they collected 2,795,000 surgical patients and scored them. And what they showed was that the incidence of VTE went up, as you can see here. But when it got to five or six, only 1.9%. But then at seven to eight, it jumped. And over eight, it jumped again. Don't these curves look familiar? People have said, well, how can you trust data from all over the world and so forth? This data is corresponding. This is exactly the same kind of data we see from the meta-analysis, the same kind of data we see from the University of Michigan. And we're gonna see more uh, cases like this. Very good data, very important data. Now let's go to China. Talk about lung surgery patients. And this was a group of, uh, of patients that had lung surgery and there were over 200 patients. And what happened here was those that had a low score, none of them got a clot. Those that had a moderate score of five to eight, even with prophylaxis, got a clot, 12%. But those that had a 40, those that had a score of nine or above, 40% of them got a clot. Very powerful information. Again, that same curve that we're seeing in the other studies. Now let's go to Russia. Same, same deal. 
Professor Lobostov, very important investigator from Russia, he and his associates have put together some beautiful programs and studied about venous thromboembolism. And here's one of them. These are very high risk patients. And you can see in this population, they all had scans. Uh, only one person with a, uh, with a five to eight score got a clot. But when it went up to nine to 11, 26%, and when the score was 12 or 15, look at that, 65% incidence of venous thromboembolism. Again, that set point, that very high set point. Now back to China. And let's talk about the use of the Caprini score in burn patients. Same story. Caprini score of five to six, less than 1% incidence of DVT. You get over eight, it's 8.82%. Very, very powerful data. And again, these data, regardless of what country you go to, they all, when the people collect the data properly and report it properly, the results are almost superimposable, but they're different depending on the group. So the, they, they're superimposable for equivalent groups, but they do vary according to the population, as you can see. And then let's take a look at otolaryngology. And this is another study in head and neck surgery. And as you can see, those people that had a score of, of, of six or less, nobody got a clot. But when the score went up to eight and above, and certainly above 10, there was a very high risk of thrombosis. And here you can see that 13% of people with a score of over eight got a clot. I'm sorry for repeating the same thing over and over again, but this is to illustrate to everyone around the world all the beautiful work that was done by all these brilliant investigators from the four corners of the world, and they're all showing the same type of data. And that's why people continue to use this score because it works in their patients. To take a look at, at uh, uh, a number of patients here, it's about 10,000 patients altogether, 5,000 from the ICU population. Score of over eight, incidence 6.3%, 11%, 18%, 8%. Extended prophylaxis and or double prophylaxis may be appropriate in these patients. I know that has to be studied, but if you start to get patients with these high scores and you send them home on prophylaxis and they continue to recur, then you better think about doubling their prophylaxis. Well, now let's talk about medical patients. There's 20 articles with a Caprini score in medical patients. It works for medical patients. You know, this isn't rocket science. The Caprini score is the most comprehensive history and physical available today that's been tested on a wide scale. You do a comprehensive history and physical, you're going to pick up more events. I don't care if it's surgery patients, medical patients, what kind of patients they are. And here in this study, with a Caprini score, and these are in medical patients, a very large population of medical patients. A score of five to six was a threefold increase over a low score, 9.4 fold increase for seven to eight scores. But again, what happens when you get to the uh, over nine group? 24%, 25% relative risk, re, relative risk in fold increase in the incidence of VTE. And then comparing the PADO and the Caprini scores, while they both worked, the, uh, this was a series of 402 controls and 222 cases. And as you can see here, the Caprini score showed, uh, was able to identify 82% of those patients, whereas only 30% were identified by the Padua score. Now let's go to Thailand. And this was a prospective study in 92 hip fracture patients screened preoperatively with duplex scans, the Caprini score well score and a D-dimer. The incidence of preoperative DVT was 16.3%. Shocking study. DVT group had a significantly higher Wells and Caprini score compared to the non-DVT group. The sensitivity of the Wells score greater than or uh, equal to two or the Caprini score of greater or equal to over 12 were 47 and 81 and 93 and 35% respectively. So what we see from all of this is the sensitivity and specificity of the Caprini score is high. And if it's over 13, the, the results are 60 and 73%. Based on all of these data, the, the physicians recommended preoperative screening of hip fracture patients with high scores preoperatively. And this is the first instance 
when this type of scanning was recommended. But this isn't routine. There's no routine here. This is for people only with very high risk scores. Very powerful data. Now let's swing back to New York City and to the Northwell Health System where uh, uh, Professor Krauss uh, was head of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery there in this hospital. Uh, they studied a thousand patients over a 15 month period. And these orthopedists used the protocol. It was agreed upon by seven of the orthopedists that would follow this protocol. They would consider everybody low risk unless they had a VTE within the prior year, morbid obesity, BMI of over 40 with additional comorbidities, active malignancy, bilateral stage joint replacement and inherited or acquired thrombophilia. Those were the high risk group. So based on that, they treated low risk patients with aspirin and those in the high risk group received a conventional anticoagulation with a conventional dose of a direct oral anticoagulant. Now, after the study was all over, the authors went back and did a Caprini score in all of these patients. And what did they find? Well, let's talk about the department score first. Here in the first part of this, you see the department score. There were eight clots that were found. And of those eight clots, the department considered classified only one of them as high risk and seven were classified as low risk, as you can see here. Now, if we take a look, when they went back and did Caprini scores on all these patients, seven of the eight patients could be correctly identified using the Caprini score with a cutoff of 10 or above. So now we know that that's probably the set point for orthopedists. So re remember, and, and I may have not said this before, but orthopedists would come up to me and said, you know, Joe, this is a nice score, but this doesn't work for orthopedics because the chest guidelines have shown that people who have a score of five and above are at high risk. Well, all of our patients have a score of five. That's what you give them for a joint replacement. So it doesn't help us. Yes, it does help you because a high risk score is not five for that population. It's 10 and above. And we know that based on what Northfield did, Northview did, and now Northview has done this, is they're doing prospective Caprini scores and everybody with a score of nine and below gets aspirin. Everybody with a score of 10 and above gets low molecular weight heparin. I don't have the final results yet, but they told me they're very, very good. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the Caprini score increases in direct proportion to the incidence of clin clinically relevant VTE events. Identifying those at high risk according to the population tested and the original concept that everyone with a score of over five is high risk is no longer true. Some patients with a score of five or six may be spared anticoagulants. Remember the otolaryngology population? Remember the meta-analysis? Those low risk patients were not benefited with anticoagulants. It only increased their bleeding rate. The set point for high risk patients needing prophylaxis is varied according to the population. And I've given you maybe even too many examples of that, but I've tried to acknowledge important investigators from around the world who have done very important work. And I also apologize for anybody that I left out. Finally, studies have ident now identified due to all of these wonderful people from everywhere, a very high risk group that may benefit from extended anticoagulant prophylaxis and perhaps even from enhanced prophylaxis. And then I'd like to talk about making sure all of you do something. And that is take your Caprini score, take it to your doctors, put it in your medical record. So when you get sick or injured, the doctor will know what the score is. You can't come running into the hospital with a serious COVID-19 infection. They're trying to save your life. Nobody's gonna ask you 40 questions, including your past obstetrical history and whether Aunt Tilly had a clot. You gotta have that in your record. And remember the importance of that is Performing a thorough history and physical gives you knowledge about your patient as if they were your good friend. And of course, you would never kill a friend. And of course, you would never treat a stranger. A, tra a stranger. I'm indebted to my dear friend in Maine, who's an academic dentist, who has given me this thought. And then uh, Sergio Giazzini has made this popular around the world. And I'm indebted to those individuals. And all of, again, all of you around the world who have contributed to the success of this scoring system. It's not about me, it's about all of you and congratulations. I'd like you all to visit my website, venusdisease.com and be on the lookout. We have a new website planned that we're going to roll out very soon. And also finally visit YouTube, V 
Venus Resource Center. I've got over 30 videos on there that you can take a look at and you can get more information. So again, thank you very much for your attention. It's been a great pleasure to present these data and please stay safe, have a good day, and we hope everybody has a great 2021.